Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 36 years we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. All forums are free and open to the public. Information on upcoming events can be found online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and I am the moderator of the forum. It is my pleasure to introduce today's guest speaker. Timothy Naftali is an associate clinical professor of history and public service at New York University. He was the founding director of the Richard Nixon Presidential Library and Museum, where he curated its nationally acclaimed exhibition on Watergate, and he was a founding director of the Presidential Recordings Program at the University of Virginia's Miller Center of Public Affairs. As an award-winning author, his writings have focused on national security, intelligence policy, international history, and presidential history. His published works include, among others, One Hell of a Gamble, Khrushchev, Castro, and Kennedy, 1958-1964, and Blind Spot, the Secret History of American Counterterrorism, which he wrote when he served as a consultant to the 9-11 Commission. He holds degrees from Yale University and Johns Hopkins University and a doctoral degree in history from Harvard. It has been the forum's tradition to invite a guest speaker following each presidential election to share their perspective on the person who won and to consider the challenges the president-elect will face. No election in our lifetimes seems to have elicited such intense response as this one. And we're counting on our speaker today to help us make sense of it. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, Dr. Timothy Naftali. Um, I'm honored be here. This is an absolutely beautiful sanctuary, and I want to thank uh, Senior Minister Hart Henderson and all of you for sharing it with me today. Uh, it's a great pleasure. Perhaps the most experienced observer of the American presidency in the 19th century, who had himself witnessed 10 presidents in action, some from close quarters, laid out the qualities needed in this country's chief executive. The ideal president needed a good temperament. It would not do for him to be irritable and quarrelsome. The White House needed a good party man and someone who had years of public service under his belt. The individual should not be suspicious or conspiratorial. He should also seek to build a governing team that was unified. He did not want what Doris Kearns Goodwin would describe much later as a team of rivals. Sounds good, doesn't it? At mid-century, I'm talking about the 19th, America elected this thoughtful observer of the presidency as its 15th president. But the only unity associated with this man is the unquestioned opinion that James Buchanan was the country's single worst president <laughs> to date. Uh, when Susan McKenna honored me by asking me to be your dragoman or your Sherpa or your guide following the 2016 election, I had no idea of the possibility <laughs> that my talk might be part of a wave of therapy sessions, <laughs> big and small, taking place <laughs> across this great country of ours in response to a huge political shock. And please, do not misunderstand me. The therapy is as much for me as for you. For with very, very few exceptions, political analysts, observers, and historians like me, who are foolish enough to make predictions, 
assumed that the margin, though the margin might not be great, Hillary Clinton's blue wall would hold, and she would be elected the first woman chief executive in our history. But alas, I live in a bubble. But we all do. I spent Columbus Day engaging in a seminar with high school teachers in the suburbs of Pittsburgh. They warned me about the number of Trump signs and their concern that a region that remembered better jobs would vote for Trump by a lot. I should have listened. But then, like all of us, I suspect, I was addicted to the website 538 and the New York Times daily updates of the probability of a Clinton election. I also watched the debates closely and saw in the first and the third one candidate dramatically outshine the other. Yes, the gap between the two candidates grew and then shrunk. But after September 26, the date of the first debate, Trump never led Clinton in the polls. And after all, I credit myself, or at least think I do, for being a data-driven person. I'm an empiricist. I was looking at the polls. I started with the Buchanan story to remind all of us that it is not only difficult to predict who will win, but also to counsel humility in predicting what would make a successful presidency. Though, in the case of Buchanan, his southern biases made his unsuitability at a time of national crisis not really that hard to predict. Last Tuesday, the American people, through the Electoral College, decided for the first time since 1952 to elevate someone without any experience of elected office. Indeed, the public decided for the first time ever to select someone with neither public administrative experience or military experience. This was, in terms of presidential history, a dramatic leap into the dark. If his campaign rhetoric is a guide to his presidential action, Donald J. Trump challenges a bipartisan commitment to trade liberalization that started after World War II, accelerated in the early 1960s during the Kennedy round, and became a cardinal principle of U.S. world policy with the U.S.-Canada Free Trade Agreement of the Reagan-Bush years and NAFTA, signed under Bush, the first Bush, but ratified under Clinton, what I had assumed would be the first Clinton, in 1993. Clinton, Bill Clinton, said in 1993, NAFTA means jobs, American jobs, and good-paying American jobs. Experts disagree on the effect of NAFTA, and we can perhaps talk a little bit about this in the Q&A, but no one disputes that the U.S. economy grew, and with it, employment in the years that followed. In addition, U.S. exports grew. The problem, and I think we'll get to this later too, is that the nature of the economic changes that came about with globalization, especially in the Midwest, changed the composition of our economies. And here, and here really will matter for our explanation of what happened on uh, last Tuesday, here people went from manufacturing jobs to service jobs, and service jobs don't pay as much. They also don't have the pensions we associate with old industry jobs. Trump also challenged the way in which we speak to and about each other. And he suggested a different vision of our identity as a nation. Given the effect of the bully pulpit of the presidency, that could well have a major effect on our national conversation. And in foreign policy, Trump challenged the 50-year consensus that is ultimately in our long-term interest to bear a lot of the burden of international collective security. That commitment to being the leader in international collective security was a direct and explicit rejection of the nationalism of the 1920s and 30s that many, many people two generations ago felt had led to World War II. And 
Trump's redefinition of our identity as a people was wrapped up in his discussion of immigration. Because the undertone, the undercurrent of that rhetoric was that we are changing and we shouldn't. And we should return to a time when we looked different. Now, how did we get here? Because this, this is the rhetoric of a campaign, and those of us who study presidents, and those of us who live through presidencies, know that the rhetoric of a campaign is not always the same as presidential action. So as an, in an attempt to figure out the connection between the two, let's see how we got to this point and, and think of the, 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 the shifts that are going on around us. We're not going around us. First, let me make clear. Donald J. Trump did not win the popular vote. The counting continues. For example, not all of the state of Washington has voted. And as Washington votes, so goes Oregon. <laughs> the, it appears that Hillary Clinton will get about 1% more of the popular vote than Donald Trump, over a million votes. But we know that our national election is actually 50 state elections that happen simultaneously. And it's the outcome of those 50 state elections, which as a result of our constitutional system will determine who becomes president. So let's look at some of those. Donald J. Trump flipped the Pennsylvania and Midwestern part of the Obama wall. How did that happen? Because in a sense, if I've said that nationally, Hillary Clinton won more votes, which by the way, in many countries would mean that she would be the president, the big change occurred here, not here, not in Minnesota, but in your neighbors, your region, and to the extent you feel close to Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania. It's, it's sort of ironic, and, and, and I, I'm sure I, I'd never say this if I, if I talked to a member of the Clinton staff, but you know that Pennsylvania describes itself as the keystone state. And in a sense, it was the keystone to the Trump victory. Let's look at your close neighbor, Wisconsin, where it seemed likely for a while, do you remember, that Russ Feingold would be returned to the Senate. Despite the headwinds coming from a GOP Speaker of the House, from Janesville, and a GOP, a Republican governor. So let's start with, with, with what used to work for people like me, or for those of us who, who study presidencies. In 1980, Ronald Reagan famously asked, are you better off today than you were four years ago? And that was a devastating question to ask in 1980 in a campaign against Jimmy Carter. It was very effective. He also created something called the Misery Index. Um, actually, I think Carter first used the term, but he'd forgotten by 1980, which was a way of, of, of figuring out how well we were doing economically by, by looking at our unemployment rate and, and the inflation rate. OK, let's do that for Wisconsin, shall we? The unemployment rate in Wisconsin in January of 2013 was 6.9%. In September of 2016, it was 4.1%. Oops. Wisconsin's economy is actually has grown. Its, its, its employment has improved. But something else happened in Wisconsin. And it has nothing to do with the misery index. It has to do with a new challenge to this country, or not so new, but one that we're beginning to really think of deeply. What about income inequality in Wisconsin? Let's not think about who spoke, who, who, how many people are employed. How well are they employed? Remember what I said about NAFTA? Um, people didn't necessarily lose jobs completely, but the nature of their job changed. OK. In 1928, the top 1% in Wisconsin made 16.8% of the income. Oh, my goodness. That's a, there's a lot of income inequality in 1928. 
In 1974, the top 1% in Wisconsin made only 7%. Oh, you are seeing a more equitable distribution of income in modern America in Wisconsin. Guess what? By 2011, the number is back to the levels in the 1920s. It's 15.7%. So if you, if you lived in Wisconsin, or your parents lived in Wisconsin, and they told you stories, from the 70s to now, your income distribution has gone off the rails. It's returned to the inequalities of the 1920s. Which means for many families in Wisconsin, it's harder to make ends meet, even if you're employed, as is likely the case. Between 1979 and 2011, real income, that's the real purchasing power of your income, for 99% of the people of Wisconsin, dropped 0.4%. So basically, you stayed even. But if you were in the top 1% of the income in Wisconsin, the value of your income went up 104%. Tell me that it's not going to have an effect on whether people feel comfortable and whether people think things are working and the change is good. By the way, it's not much better across the Midwest. Um, the, uh, the bottom 99%, and that's bottom, that's most everybody by far, across the Midwest, the in real income only went up just under 2%. In Wisconsin, it, it was worse, but it wasn't much better here. So, well, maybe some way the economy is what did this. But let's look at the exit polls for Wisconsin, shall we? The economy was the most important issue for voters. 54% in the exit polls in Wisconsin said, that's, that's the issue that matters most to us. But guess who they voted for? Hillary Clinton. Those voters in Wisconsin who thought that the economy was the biggest issue voted for Hillary Clinton 52 to 43%. That was, wait a second, this is completely, what was motivating the people of Wisconsin? And this is the story. It was the next two issues that mattered most to the people of Wisconsin. Number two was terrorism. 20% of the people of Wisconsin said the most important issue to them was terrorism, and 61% of them voted for Trump. And what's the third most important issue for the people of Wisconsin, according to the exit polls, which we've learned polls, you have to take them with a grain of salt. The all-important issue for people of the Badger State, immigration. Because God knows, as a state that is right next to the Mexican border, Wisconsin <laughs> faces a challenge. No doubt the wall will be built somewhere around Janesville. A Canadian. <laughs> but when, when you look, and by the way, of those who said that immigration was the biggest issue to them in Wisconsin, 74% voted for Trump. But when asked what to do about immigration, the immig immigration problem, your good neighbors in Wisconsin were not heartless. No, 70% of them, including many of the people who voted for Trump, said, oh, let's find a pathway to citizenship. Only 26% said we should deport the people. So 74% of them voted for a man who said we should deport the people, but only 26% wanted to deport the people. Are you confused? <laughs> well, I am too. <laughs> now, let's try to figure this out together. Turnout. This was an ugly election. This was an, I don't have children, I have a niece and nephew. But I can imagine parents throughout this country wanting to turn it off. Listen, I don't have children and I wanted to turn it off. But the corrosive effect, the language was terrible. It turned off a lot of people and, some, and a lot of people didn't vote. Okay. Um, Donald Trump got the same number of votes in Wisconsin as Mitt Romney did in 2012. And Mitt Romney lost to Obama 53 to 46 percent. 
There wasn't a groundswell of new people voting for Trump. It's just that Hillary Clinton's people didn't come out to vote for her. Uh, by the way, uh, Barack Obama got more votes in Pennsylvania in 2012 than Donald Trump did this time. So when people were asked in the exit polls in Wisconsin, what issues bothered you? Half of the voters said that Donald J. Trump's treatment of women bothered them. And half of the voters said that Hillary Clinton's use of a pri private email server bothered them. But 18% of those who said they were bothered by Donald Trump's treatment of women or speed, 18% voted for him anyway. Whereas people were much harsher on Hillary about her private email server. Eight, only 8% 8 of those who said it was a big deal voted for Hillary Clinton. Now, if immigration and terrorism are motivating the people of Wisconsin to vote for someone like Donald Trump, let's look at the issue of immigration and terrorism, shall we, for Wisconsin. Immigration. There has been a change in Wisconsin. The, the state has gone from 2.5 percent of, 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 of people who were not born in the United States to 4.8 percent between 1990 and 2013. As somebody who loved, lived in California at one point, I would say that 4.8 percent of the population is non, as not born in the United States is not a really major immigration uh, population. There are illegal immigrants in Wisconsin. There are 85,000 of them. They represent 1.5 percent of the population. There's an estimated 3 million illegal immigrants in California. California went for Hillary Clinton in a big way. Wisconsin did not. But maybe there is a, a dark side, to, a darker side to this that we may have to come to grips with, which is that the face of Wisconsin is changing. And maybe there are people there who don't want to see that face change. The number of Latinos and Latinas went from 2% in 1990 to just over 6%. And the number of Asian Americans went from 1% to 2.5%. Not a large percentage, but if you are one of those who is sensitive to the change in the nature of our demographics, you will have seen a change in Wisconsin. And perhaps that's what made immigration an issue for you. And what about terrorism? Well, the last terrorist incident in Wisconsin was in 2012. It was at Oak Creek, and it was right-wing terrorism, and it involved an attack on a Sikh temple. So what does this mean, just looking at Wisconsin? But Wisconsin was supposed to be part of Hillary Clinton's wall, which would keep her, which pr provide her with the presidency. These are the conclusions, at least interim conclusions, I have to reach. One, Donald Trump has no national mandate. He doesn't have a national mandate. He won a region. There were other regions he won, but that, they were part of the Romney coalition, which wasn't enough for a Republican to, be, to win the White House. Hillary Clinton, I will repeat, won the popular vote. Democrats picked up seats in the House and the Senate. But Donald Trump managed to use national issues not regional or local or state, but national issues, terrorism and immigration to swing enough voters to flip states. Terrorism is not a major threat to the Badger state. Neither is immigration, yet people overwhelmingly, those who felt those issues mattered, overwhelmingly supported Donald Trump. What does that mean for us? That issues that have nothing to do or very little to do with your state can motivate you to vote for someone whose policy prescriptions, in some cases, you don't agree with. What Trump's achievement was, I believe, in large effect, was to whip and exploit fears based on rumor and assumption, not on the day-to-day -day facts that we experience. Which brings me to the presidency. With this as the background to the election, my colleagues and I, we will all be looking at this as a possible populist wave, 
and we love studying the history of populism. But was there really a populist wave? If the election was decided in this way, in this region, are we talking about some new America, or are we just talking about a divided country with a, a shift in the margins, which has nevertheless brought about a huge change in the messaging of the presidency? You see, we have a winner-take-all system. We're not a parliamentary democracy. In a parliamentary democracy, given this vote, it would be a divided parliament, and you could have a non-confidence motion in a couple of months, and your prime minister would be removed. But we don't have that kind of system. I'm not suggesting we should have one. I understand the nature of our country and the history. Nevertheless, we have a system where you have a winner-take-all uh, executive, and that person has four years unless they commit high crimes and misdemeanors, which we may talk about in the Q&A. <laughs> and this is where, this is, this is where I, I, I will speak to you with, about caution and hope. And here's my caution part. One of the great students of transitions, uh, a man named Richard Neustadt, who taught at Columbia and served as an, ex an advisor to Harry Truman, John F. Kennedy, and Jimmy Carter, and even gave some advice to James Baker, who would be a very important player in the Reagan administration and later in the George H.W. Bush administration. He cautioned those who listened to him that transitions are vulnerable because of haste, hubris, and the unfamiliar, unfamiliarity native to newness. In the nine days since the election, it's clear that the Trump transition has been vulnerable to all of these things. The other is something uh, that I can speak to because I, I had the privilege of working for all of you. I worked for the federal government. One of the great things you can do with your life. Uh, serve in the military, work for the federal government. It's a great sense, it's a great opportunity to do service. Um, when I worked for the federal government, I, I was given the uh, responsibility of turning the Nixon Library, which had been a private institution, into a public nonpartisan institution. That was, that was my charge and I was so happy to have it. Um, and I didn't particularly like Richard Nixon before I started the job. But I didn't get the job because I liked or disliked him. I'm just, I was a, I'm a professional historian. By the end of the, my time in Yorba Linda, five years, I came to really detest <laughs> Richard Nixon. <laughs> um, and, and, and what I want to share with you, and we can talk more about this in the Q&A, is that the Nixon presidency uh, had at its center an unstable man. An unstable man with very dark instincts. And the presidents, those around him, knew this. And they tried to create a system to contain the darkness. And the system was set up by H.R. Bob Haldeman, his chief of staff. A system that contains darkness is a system of men, I, um, I mean of individuals. But the containment depends on the goodness of the ones containing, not just the goodness of the one being contained. And the people doing the containing in the Nixon period were not good men for the most part. Bob Haldeman himself was a, a racist and an anti-Semite. Uh, and so the extent to which he could contain the darkness depended on the extent to which he understood what was darkness. And we know what came of the Nixon experiment. The reason that the Nixon period was not worse for this country was that there were other people outside the White House, good government Republicans, I would call them, who were patriots, who said no. We lost one of those yesterday. Melvin Laird was the Secretary of Defense, and he was a great 
and good man. In his authorized biography, he tells the story of a late night telephone call from Richard Nixon that would have had him bomb an airfield in Jordan where there were 184 passengers on two planes that had been hijacked by the PFLP, a splinter group of the PLO. Nixon was slurring his words. He, he didn't have a drinking problem, but he, he, he had a sleeping problem, and he used to take pills to deal with his anxiety. And it, it would take one or two cognacs or scotches, and he wouldn't really be speaking clearly. He ordered the US Air Force to bomb those planes to show strength to the terrorists. That would have killed uh, 184 innocent people from around the world. Clearly, and it was not the decision of his National Security Council, but he, he had an episode at night, and he was calling late at night, because Nixon was addicted to these late night calls. There was no Twitter then. <laughs> Mel Laird, you can't say no to your commander in chief. What you can do is you can prevaricate. You can stall. You can hope that when he wakes up in the morning after a good night's sleep, he will have forgotten the silly order that he sent in the middle of the night. And that's what he did. And it didn't just happen once. And there were other people who said no to implementing the enemies list, which Richard Nixon had ordered, who said we should not politicize the IRS. And there were people who said no about wiretapping. So that, that was a good thing, but it wasn't enough. And the abuses piled up, and ultimately, Richard Nixon was the first so far president to have to resign. What I am saying here is that our system of government has some flaws because of the strength of the executive branch. And that what we have to hope for is the goodness of the people around a president as much as the goodness in the president himself. The second thing I would mention to you is that for the first time, um, we're, we, we, have, we are on the verge of having a unified government for the first time in a long time. Since 1933, the, the grand old party has controlled two branches of government only twice, 1953 through 55, 2005 to 2007. And all three branches of government only once under George W. Bush. Once the Supreme Court confirms a ninth person, all three branches of government arguably will be under the control of one party. But is it really a unified party? Is Donald Trump a Republican? Will Republicans share the particular points of view that he has espoused because they are actually not part of the canon of Republican thinking under the Bush, first under Reagan, then the first Bush, and the second Bush? That is what we need to watch. And I'm not going to predict. I don't know. It'll depend on ambition, and it'll depend also on the reaction of the American people, which gets me to my final thought before we move to questions. What do we all do? We have a First Amendment right, which we should exercise when we feel the need to, to express dissent, so long as it is nonviolent. But for those of us who don't necessarily want to go outside, in the cold especially, there's something else we can do. And it's part of being a good citizen. Be watchful. Be engaged. Look for data. I know the data didn't always point in the, in the right, to the right conclusion, but data is better than not data. Real news is better than fake news. Be involved. Be thoughtful. Ask questions. Read everything you can. You don't have to be political. Just be watchful. Be vigilant. You see, government is still made of individuals. Will this unified government permit a man without a majoritarian populist wave behind him to dominate? It's not necessarily so. Indeed, the population of this country, the people of Wisconsin who really don't want deportation, though they voted for Trump, the, the country can actually say that certain measures are not what they expected and make it clear and speak. 
not with a unified voice. We're not, thank goodness, an authoritarian country. But a mixed voice, but a noisy one. How many failures on the part of the government, should they happen, will be acceptable? Will those who voted for change accept a lower stock market, meaning lower pension plans, if we do move towards trade nationalism? Will they accept less choice in health care? Will they accept that maybe they actually can't get insurance in the way in which it has been promised? And how will they react to domestic terrorism should it happen? With a unified government, whom do you blame? Ronald Reagan was a master of saying, I can't achieve everything I promised because of the Democrats in Congress. He had a Republican Senate for a while, but he would point to the Democrats in the House. Well, who, whom are they going to blame? A unified government means unified blame. So is the Constitution up to the challenge? Yes, it is, if we all do our part. Richard Nixon was undone by people in his government who said no, but that wouldn't have had him or led to his resignation. He was undone because there was a vigilant press and a vigilant Congress, and ultimately because there were tapes. I don't expect there to be tapes, and I also don't expect, I don't want to expect impeachment. It's not healthy for us. It's not a good way. You see, in the 1990s, there was a bit of revenge going on. I know this because I had the opportunity as head of the Nixon Library to ask Trent Lott, who was a leader in the 1990s in the impeachment process against Bill Clinton, but he was also a participant in the impeachment process against Richard Nixon, and he made it clear to me that in the 1990s it was all about politics, whereas in the 1970s it was about constitution, about who we are. So however, however nice the idea of a political impeachment may feel, it's not good for us. It should be there in case the bad stuff happens, but the first goal of the citizen is not to ask the Constitution to remove the elected president. It's to make sure the elected president does what the American people really want. So with that, I want you to know that I'm an optimist because I'm an, I believe in you. But at the moment, I'm a little bit, how should I put it? It's hard to be an optimist. But at the core is a sense that we've overcome challenges before. I think about, I remember when I was living in California, how Proposition 8, which was overturning same-sex marriage, won in 2008. And look at the changes in our country that have happened since. For African Americans, though, the gains have not been enough, but there have been remarkable gains. For women, though, they haven't been enough, there have been gains. The country has evolved. So with that in mind, I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Timothy Naftali. You are listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister here at Westminster Church and moderator of the forum. Our speaker today is presidential historian and national security expert, Dr. Timothy Naftali. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to thank our broadcast partner, the statewide network of Minnesota Public Radio News, heard in the Twin Cities at 91.1 FM, and the co-sponsor of today's forum, the online news source, MinPost. We invite you to join us for our next forum on Tuesday, Tuesday, December 13th at noon, when Tom Friedman will be our speaker. Further information is available at our website, westminsterforum.org. And now, Dr. Naftali, if you would return to the pulpit, I will present the questions from our audience. I want to begin with a question not about uh, the recent election, but about the one that took place eight years ago and the presidency of Barack Obama. As an historian of presidents, what do you think uh, will be lasting contributions of the Obama presidency? Um, I, I will answer that um, by 
first by saying that I wrote a, a small biography of George Herbert Walker Bush. And his legacy and his and support for him has grown with time. And it's not simply because of comparison to his son. <laughs> and I apologize to the future. I apologize it now because I was just talking about humility. But if you'll allow me this, the, allow me, you've asked me the question, if you allow me a little bit of immodesty about this, because I'm going to make a prediction. I think Barack Obama's presidency will be viewed upon by us 25, 30 years ago as one of, uh, one of the great presidencies of the modern era. And a lot of people are going to be mad at me now, but that's OK. I don't think Barack Obama failed us. I think we failed him. And what I mean by that is that he challenged us to think of a post-racial country. And he challenged us to think about America's role in the world. And he challenged us to think about the environment. And I know there are people out there saying, oh my god, this is just a big liberal speech here. Oh no, oh no. So let me remind you that I can be nonpartisan. Let me tell you what I mean. Syria is a big, tough problem. And I suspect when national security historians get at the data, I hope to be here 50 years from now, I'm not so sure that's going to happen, but you know, I'll try my best. When that data is declassified, I think you'll see that, that, that when ISIS took Mosul, it was a surprise. But the president got, was under a lot of pressure to put boots on the ground in Syria which would have made Syria our problem, which would have meant we would have to reconstruct a country that has had a very sad history with very weak institutions. That is a, not only a tough thing to do, it's almost impossible in a short time frame. We've seen this problem in Iraq. He didn't. He took a lot of criticism for not being strong, for allowing America not to be at the head of it. But he understood that not every, not every foreign policy problem, first of all, can be solved. Many of them are just managed. And not every foreign policy problem should be solved by the United States alone. <laughs> On climate change, the use of solar devices is up 2,000% in our country. As a, result, <laughs> as a result, carbon emissions are down while our economy is growing. Barack Obama inherited an economy that was as close to the Depression as we have come since World War II. He helped save the auto industry, which people in Michigan forgot a couple of Tuesdays ago. The point being that though the recovery has been slower and has not been as good as one would hope, the fact that there is a recovery, he deserves some credit for, doesn't he? <laughs> But more, more importantly, there hasn't been a scandal. <laughs> and actually, it's, 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 it's hard not to speak of this without getting a little emotional. Can you imagine the pressure that this man was under because he was the first African-American president? Can you imagine how he knew that if he messed up, how this would not just hurt him and his legacy, but might hurt a chance for a future African-American man or woman to become president? No one has been under that kind of pressure. And, and he has escaped thus far, touch on this wood, a second-term scandal, which seems to be endemic to the presidency, historically. That's a big deal. The fact that there's no evidence, nor even a hint, even among his allies, his enemies and adversaries, that there's any personal corruption or indulgence. The self-discipline shown by Barack Obama is not only important to our African, to African Americans, but to us all, as a reminder that self-discipline is linked to 
success as a president, that will be remembered because that's so unusual in our history. So I would say that the presidency of Barack Obama, it's, it's appreciation, the American people's appreciation will only grow with time. You watch, in about a, in a year or two, people will say, oh, I so wish Barack Obama was our president. <laughs> yes. We have a number of questions coming forward, uh, particularly from students about the Electoral College. Uh -huh. Now, how do you respond to arguments about preventing the dominance of certain states or ensuring that all votes are equally represented? What about the Electoral College? Here's my, my answer. We don't have a perfect union. We seek a more perfect union. If we had had a perfect union in the 18th century, we wouldn't have had a civil war in the 19th century. The Constitution has flaws. Uh, the Electoral College is an artifact of a time when slave states wanted to have more of a say than their population would allow in selecting presidents. It was also a product of a period of much less democracy. There was a sense that the people weren't really ready to choose. Electors would choose on their behalf. It was more representative government than direct democracy. And over time, as we, we dropped certain requirements. You didn't have to own property anymore. You didn't have to pay a poll tax. As African Americans could vote, as women could vote. We have become more and more of the democracy of the language that Thomas Jefferson used. The Electoral College is an artifact of a period of representative democracy, and it will go someday. But right now, the challenge is, is to support our Constitution, because that will protect us from any instability at the center. And I want to remind you of something. Those of you who have served in our armed forces, who have worked for our, our federal government, remember this and be proud of it. When you take an oath of, of, of office in this country, you do not take an oath to the president. You take an oath to the Constitution. That's really, really important. Don't forget it. And that's... That's a reason why you should encourage people to work in the federal government, even if they do not agree with the new chief executive. Our government is big. Our government needs really good ethical people throughout it for our system and our country to work. So I would say that I think the Electoral College needs to be changed over time. It's not first on my list, of, on my to-do list at the moment. You spoke of the uh, difficulty and complexity of a transition between one government or one administration and another. Uh, as an historian now, you've watched a number of presidential transition teams at work. Uh, we've seen one now at work for a few days. Any reflections on how that transition is going? <laughs> well, uh, I'll tell you one thing. Um, most president-elects talk to us within a couple of days of winning. We haven't had a press conference from Mr. Trump. Um, Ronald Reagan, by the way, had only one press conference during his transition, but it came within days of his election. Uh, we need more openness and transparency, which is remarkable from somebody who argued that the Washington elite wasn't transparent and he would change that. That's, first of all, very important. Secondly, we have to look at the character and the strength and the ideas of the people he selects. Bad transitions don't necessarily translate into bad administrations. George H.W. Bush didn't have a very good transition. And he chose somebody for Secretary of Defense who was rejected, a man named John Tower. And I would argue that certainly in foreign policy, George H.W. Bush's administration was one of the best uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the 20th century. So a bad transition. Um, on the other hand, Richard Nixon, Trains ran on time. They just were running in the wrong direction. But the trains, he, he named most of his cabinet very quickly. Bill Clinton, on the other hand, took forever, as did John F. Kennedy. So the, the fact that this transition is having many problems, that's not unusual in American history. But it doesn't mean the government's going to be bad. I would say there are some red flags, though. And one of them is the selection of Mr. Bannon. I don't know Mr. Bannon. I don't know him. But I've heard him. 
Mr. Bannon, whether he believes it or not, has been giving, giving a voice to the ugliest parts of the American community. That kind of ugliness does not bring people together. It divides people. And that kind of ugliness, when it's in the deep web, is bad enough. But when it's actually at the center of the messaging of the White House, then that will poison the national conversation. Um, I don't know what this man believes. I know what he says. It's not always the same thing. His position, his position, his new title has an enormous history to it. He's been named special counsel. That's a title that was developed by Franklin Roosevelt for Samuel Roseman, his chief speechwriter. That's a title that was used by Ted Sorensen in the Kennedy administration. That is a title that was also used by Charles Colson in the Nixon administration. And what Mr. Bannon needs to think about is whether he wants to be Ted Sorensen or Charles Colson. And if he chooses Charles Colson, it's not for me to say, God help us. The man who should say that is next to me. But we're in trouble. <laughs> we have time for one more brief answer. Could you tell us uh, your sense of hopefulness about the American political realities, taking the long view, perhaps, as an historian? Uh, hmm. I, I love this country. And look what we do when we do things together. Think of how each generation has redefined liberty. If we stopped, if we had stopped in 19, I don't know, you pick a date, 1929, and said, we're done. We've got that more perfect union. It's set. Think of how many of us would not be fully participating in our society. And think of what we all would have lost, all right? Think about what life would be like for African Americans and women and the LGBTQ community, let alone people of faith whose faith is not the same as the chief executives. Liberty has expanded, but it doesn't expand, in a, it doesn't expand easily. It's like two steps forward, one step back. There is a strong, and it's historically true, a strong resistance to the expansion of liberty. But the linear trend is still positive. That's what you have to keep in mind. All right, in the 1970s, those of you who can remember the 1970s, you'll know that the possibilities for liberty seemed enormous by the late 70s, and then there was a retrenchment. I'm talking about social liberty. But then what happens in the late 90s and afterwards? The fact of the matter is, if you take the long view, you should be bullish on the country. The problem is we have to get through the next few years together. And you've got to remember what it makes us America, what makes us America. And I'm not asking, when I say fight for it, I'm not asking you to pick up pitchforks. I mean, who has a pitchfork anyway? <laughs> what I'm saying is, be the American you want to be. And there's so many of us who remember the, the past and love the present that it'll give us a good future. Just be that person. Do not be cowed. Do not be intimidated. Do never allow your rights to be transgressed upon. Be the American you want to be, and I think all will work out. Thank, Thank you, Timothy Naftali.